Manoush. This is a lecture for Psychology 2, the Edmund Burke School. We're looking at Chapter 5 in Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely. And the title of the chapter is Price of a Free Cookie. Uh, the first thing, probably the, the basic idea for this chapter, uh, when price is not a part of the exchange, we become less selfish maximizers and start caring more about the welfare of others. And that basic concept relates back to uh, past chapters we've, we've been looking at, both about what happens when prices turn to zero, strange things happen, and this idea of market norms versus social norms. When the price is zero, this statement is saying, uh, we begin to act less like market animals and more like social animals. Uh, in the market, you're always maximizing your own selfish interests, and that's good for the market. Um, but in the social world, you don't. Uh, you start, you care for others in relationships, social relationships. Uh, every year, used to, a store that's now out of business called Filing's Basement would have um, this running of the bride, where essentially they would have uh, designer dresses, uh, wedding dresses, on sale at bargain basement prices, and uh, the women would, they'd open the doors and all the potential brides-to-be would rush in in a huge stampede, uh, grabbing dresses, pulling dresses out of each other's hands, uh, swearing at each other and fighting to get at these designer dresses at bargain basement prices. And that demonstrates uh, two reasons why in traditional economics demand goes up. Clearly in this state there was, there was a lot of demand for these wedding dresses. Uh, the first reason why demand increases is because the price is lower. Price is lower, demand goes up, because more people can afford to buy at that price. Second reason why demand might go up as the price lowers is there are some people who not only can afford it, other people maybe can now afford to buy multiples. So now there's a, de a greater demand uh, for the dresses. And even, even in this, uh, with wedding dresses, people would grab multiples and buy multiples and then return the they just didn't want later. So Dan Ariely and his colleagues decided to test this. Um, and the way they did it is they gave away Starburst candy. Uh, so they set up a table and they had, uh, and they would switch the signs every hour or so. And the signs were small enough that you couldn't tell until you got to the table exactly what was going on. But it would basically say, you know, get your candy here. Okay, and so they had the Starburst. And every hour, sometimes they had the Starbursts for sale for one cent. And other times, uh, they had the Starbursts for free. And just a big uh, basket of Starbursts on the, on the table. Um, so what happened? Uh, every hour that they had the Starbursts available for one cent, 58 students per hour took a Starburst. Every hour that they had them free, 207 students per hour. So we know that by lowering the price from one cent to zero, demand increased. This is uh, in concert with the traditional economic idea that when prices go down, demand goes up. We just looked at that with the wedding dresses. Okay? But the multiple units part is not satisfied. What happens in the one cent condition is every person that came by took three and a half starbursts and gave, I mean, obviously they didn't take three and a half. They took three or four and gave three or four cents. Um, but when they were free, remember, more students going by, demand going up, price went down, they took fewer candies per student. In fact, most of them just came by and took a single Starburst. So this contradicts that traditional economic model of demand increasing, because you think at a lower price, people might want more Starburst, but in fact, they take less. So the question is, what's going on here? Is this, why are people not acting like rational economic actors? And so they were curious what was going on, and they, and, and they wanted to say, well, maybe it's just something weird with low prices in general. So they tried doing the same experiment, but they just uh, reduced the prices. So reduced the price from 10 cents to 5 cents. And again, as you would predict with traditional economics, more people came by to get candy, and they took more multiples of it. So that actually fits, just like traditional economics. But what if we drop the price from 5 cents to 1 cent? Same exact results. And then again, they drop it from one cent to zero, and it essentially ends up looking exactly like the last experiment. So the conclusion 
is that there's a switch from market norms to social norm, but it only happens when you get to zero. It doesn't happen even at one cent. So this question then of what is it about social norms that causes us to only take one starburst? There's not a good slide for this, but it's in the book. And the idea, you know, Dan Ariely kind of talks about it a little bit is like it's a communal good. And when there's a communal good, people limit themselves, and they limit themselves because they are concerned that everyone gets enough. We're sharing. So when you go out to eat, he gives an example, and everybody has a slice of pizza, or everybody has uh, a plate of sushi, quite often nobody wants to take the last slice. Everybody wants to make sure that they get their fair amount. Because it, once it's something that we're all sharing, it's in the realm of social good. And once something is free, it's zero cents, then we have a, a flip of switches in the way we think about it, and we don't want to take too much. So then they ask the question, well, what about effort? Is effort going to be in the realm of social uh, norms, or is it going to be in the realm of market norms? Uh, if you have some not, you just pay for it or you get it for free, but you actually have to do something, not paying for it, but you have to do something to get uh, the good. So in one condition, they offered people some free chocolates, notice the plural, and they said, would you like some free chocolates? Totally free. That condition satisfies social norms. They're free. We're out, we're trying, and they even tried to get people to take multiple chocolates. Okay. Condition two. Would you like some chocolates? The cost is one cent each. So if you want the chocolate, you have to pay for it. This is a business decision you and I will make, and that is market norm. So what about effort? Condition three, they had them work on a task, relatively easy task with a bunch of letters on pieces of paper, and there's a bunch of, uh, they find pairs of S's, so it's kind of like concentration. For each pair you find, you get to take a chocolate, if you want to. And you can work for as long as you want. So however much effort you want to put in, you can get chocolate. I'm not paying you for chocolate, and I'm not getting it for free, but I have to do something to get the chocolate. So what did they find? Well, in the money condition, market condition, people took 30 chocolates. In the social condition, maybe because they offered them free chocolates, plural, people took one and a half, so basically one or two, usually. And in the effort condition, people ended up taking 8.6. So 8.6 is obviously somewhere between 30 and 1.5, but it's a lot closer to 1.5 than 30. So the conclusion here is that when you have to work for something, it's a mix. It's more like social norms, but it's still a little bit like market norms. And that becomes important if you want to talk about things that require effort to get. Um, even working, you're getting a salary, but there's effort involved. And so how do you feel about putting in extra effort that you're not necessarily getting rewarded for? What is the reward? Why should you put in the extra effort? Okay. Last part of the chapter, uh, Dan Ariely takes a look at an example uh, in public policy. We've got uh, this idea of cap and trade. So cap and trade basically says, um, you know, everybody, you can pollute a certain amount of carbon dioxide or whatever nasty chemical you want. And above that, if for every gallon you want to uh, pollute or every unit you want to pollute, you have to pay a fee. Okay, it's not a fine, but it's a, a fee. So you're paying for the right to pollute over a certain amount. Um, and the idea is you put it, so you got this cap, and then if you go under your cap, then you can sell your allowances to somebody who had needs to go over and you can actually make money by reducing your pollution or if you want you can just pay more and pollute more. Um, so Dan Ariely proposes that we that once you take polluting and put a sort of market on it, it's a cap and trade market after all, that you've moved something. So you've moved it out of the realm of social norms and into the realm of market norms and then you should expect people to make a more rational less caring decision. So he's worried, and I think, you know, that it won't reduce pollution. In fact, people will just pay more to pollute more. They are no longer concerned about morality because you've made it a business decision. We're no longer concerned about social uh, norms because it's no longer a social norm decision, it's a business decision. So his idea, 
uh, perhaps is that maybe this is not a great solution if we want to reduce pollution. Maybe a better solution would be to somehow uh, make businesses think, or people making these decisions, think more along the realm of social norms when they're considering reducing pollution, and not necessarily about how much money they can make uh, one way or the other. Um, so it's sort of a, a question, an open-ended question uh, for you uh, to think about. What could you do to motivate people, to trigger people to think in social norms as opposed to market norms in order to get them to behave in a way in which they care about others. So in essence, can we get them to take one starburst instead of 30? What do we have to do to do that? Certainly, putting a price on it doesn't seem like the way to go.